What is up, HVAC Control Pro? This is Eric Stromquist with Stromquist.com and ControlTrends.com, your source for Control Pro news. All right, what's your pressure? What is a pressure independent control valve, and why should you care? Well, I got to tell you, man, a pressure independent control valve is going to solve a lot of your control problems, and it's going to save you a ton of energy. Plus, it's going to reduce your operational expense. The big news on the street is Johnson Controls has come out with their version of the pressure independent control valve. Okay, so pressure independent control valve, basically uh, your regular valves work off of pressure. So that means your valve can move up and down based on a control signal, but if your system pressure is changing, it really can screw up your flow, okay? So typically you have a flow valve, plus you have a, a setter, and it just gets complicated. From a maintenance standpoint, it can be a nightmare to get those set up right, and they typically don't control all that well. That's where you're getting all those calls with people too hot, too cold. A pressure independent control valve kind of combines a pressure regulator in with the control valve. So that basically means that it's not dependent on system pressure. You can just actually set it to GPM and that GPM is going to just lock in, giving you very, very smooth control, very accurate control. And at the same time, it's going to save a ton of energy because your chillers and your pumps and your coils are not overworking. Okay, so the big news is JCI has come out with their version of it. I got two gentlemen I caught up with, uh, Frank Spear and Dave Roback from Johnson Controls. Caught up with them on a CGNA webinar. Hey man, check this out. You're going to hear this. They walk you through all the specifics of how these these valves work and what they can, how they can benefit you. But more importantly, Johnson Controls put their unique twist on it. So stay tuned, tuned to the end of the video to make sure that uh, you, you check out this unique twist. Um, level set and define a few terms so that we're all, uh, when I say certain things, we're all speaking the same, the same language, so to speak. Then we're going to jump into pick valves in general and kind of do a little bit deeper dive on, on what they are and, and how they work. We'll talk about, excuse me, <clears throat> we'll talk about why not just use a, a, a regular control valve and in, in conjunction with auto balancing valve, right? What's the difference? And then we'll wind it up with a, a view of our uh, our particular version of a pick valve, which, which is our VP140 series. We've got a couple of different options and uh, really excited to talk to you about uh, a new extension of that line that we just introduced uh, recently. And then a couple of the added value added services that Johnson Controls offers. All right. So um, from a from a Definition of terms perspective. So a standard control valve, whether that's a ball valve or a globe valve, um, we'll refer to those as pressure dependent valves. And I say that because the, uh, th those types of valves, uh, I think you're all familiar with that equation for water anyway, right? Where Q or the, the flow, the GPM, that's equal to the CV of the valve uh, times the square root of the pressure drop across the valve, right? So what that means is that even though you don't change the position of a valve, the flow through that valve can change based solely on fluctuations in um, pressure um, in the system. So if you have any um, pressure changes upstream or downstream of the valve, that flow through that valve uh, will change. So in effect, a standard control valve or a pressure dependent valve, you're really only controlling position Right, either the the angle of the ball or the or the travel of the stem on a on a globe valve, and you're maintaining that valve position based on the control signal. When you get into the realm of pressure independent valves, um, they have a built-in regulator in that valve that effectively um, eliminates the effect of delta P or any changes of that in, that the valve sees. So now uh, you can imagine. Even though you're not changing the the uh, position of a valve, you may have pressure fluctuations in your system, but your flow is going to remain constant and and correlate to what it should be based on the position of that valve. So now instead of just position control, you have flow control. In other words, your control signal is is controlling to a specific GPM uh, and not just a position. Another term. Uh, that you might, well, let me back up real quick too. So that by eliminating the whole effect of delta P on that valve, it really simplifies how you size these valves as well because you no longer have to use that sizing equation. Uh, 
because selection is based on the GPM of the valve and not the CV of the valve any longer. Low delta T syndrome, that occurs when your overall um, design chill temperature range is not maintained. So in other words, the supply temperature or the water leaving the chiller, for example, minus the, the temperature of the return water, if that's not large enough, you start to gain inefficiencies. Your whole efficiency comes in it, your whole system becomes inefficient. And so you're losing energy, you're wasting pumping capacity, you're wasting chiller efficiency, uh, all sorts of energy implications on that front. But it also causes um, comfort issues, right? And, and one of the main causes of low delta T is an overflow of coils when you're at a part load condition. So either the pump upstream is pumping too much or, um, or the uh, downstream um, um, activities that the valve sees are causing um, a decrease in delta T there. So you're underflowing. So either underflowing or overflowing has effects on comfort and also low delta T. So when you look at, uh, again, this, think of a valve just in a, in a static position, okay? So this is just a, a position of the valve stem or ball. It's not moving, we're not modifying at all. All we're varying is the delta P across that valve. And what you'll see is that the flow increases as your pressure drop across that valve increases. And the curve looks somewhat like this, depending on the valve, it's, it's a little bit different, but the idea is the same for all pressure dependent valves. Now, contrast that with uh, the, the same type of curve that you see with the pressure independent valve. Here again, the valve position is not changed or moved. The only thing that's being varied is the delta P across that valve. And what you'll see on that chart on the right is that once you reach, reach a minimum delta P across that valve, so it's got to be high enough to activate that pressure regulator. Once you're past that, um, you have consistent flow, even though your delta P is increasing, right? So that valve is mechanically handling those dynamic responses in the system. And it's making sure that um, because we're not changing the position of the valve, the flow should not change either. So that's kind of how you can view the, uh, on a fundamental level, the difference between these two types of valves. So, and I want to talk a little bit about um, equal percentage curves and uh, linear characteristics versus on-off characteristics and kind of frame that all up. So on, on the left there is what you could consider the desirable control curve, right? You'd, you'd, want, it be, you'd want it to be as linear as possible. So in other words, the flow rate for 50% flow rate through a coil you would expect 50% um, um, energy transfer in that coil. That makes for simplest, most accurate control, right? The problem is heat exchangers do not have a linear curve like that. They look somewhat like the chart that you see in the middle of the page there. Now you compound that with uh, different valve strokes. I'm showing an equal percentage characteristic valve curve on the far right which I'm sure you, you've heard of before. So all these things kind of work together and we'll kind of walk through that in the next slide here. So now remember, the goal is to take that, um, that bent heat exchanger curve and ultimately come up with a linear control curve that you see at the bottom left there. Now, if you walk through and you think of a, of a case where you have an on-off valve characteristic curve. So you've got an on-off valve, right? So the top graph on there, it shows that um, you get pretty much maximum flow very quickly. When you combine that with the curve of the heat exchanger, your combined curve is even more dramatic in terms of its on-off um, characteristics. So it's very hard to control because you have a, an extremely steep curve so before you get to even 10%, you're almost at 100% um, flow, right, control curve. So what, what that means is there's very little modulation. It's impossible, in fact, and you either have all or nothing. So uh, when you think about that in terms of energy efficiency and occupant comfort, it's not ideal. 
Now, it, it works for some situations, but um, as you work your way toward the right on this page, kind of the next best thing to an on-off valve characteristic is a linear valve characteristic curve. So it's kind of the interesting thing here is you think linear, and linear is where you want to get to, but you have to remember that you're combining the valve characteristics with the heat exchanger's characteristic curve. So if you combine that linear valve characteristic curve with the heat exchanger curve, the resulting curve, while not as extreme as the on-off curve, it's not linear yet. But it does allow you to modulate and regulate better than, than in an on-off situation. But you're still not at the point where you have linear control. Now, last but not certainly not least, you have uh, an equal percentage valve characteristic curve. So that's um, the curve on the far top, far right. You'll see that um, as you approach 50% of the valve opening, you're still not uh, at 50% like you would be with the linear curve. Now that's somewhat counterintuitive, but remember when you combine that curve with the shape of a typical heat exchanger curve, you start to approach the curve on the bottom right, which is linear, right? And that's the ultimate goal. So that's that's a way to kind of understand and, and view how different valve characteristic curves, when you match them up with heat ex the, a typical heat exchanger curve, why it has those implications and, and what you pay for, right? Uh, On-off uh, is an okay solution if, if you're fine with all or nothing. Um, and then as you move to the, towards the right, you get to a, um, a better and then ultimately the best solution in terms of uh, control. So your, uh, your energy efficiency and your occupant comfort are much better as you go farther to the right on this scale. Now, a little bit of, um, I think, uh, context in terms of why you may have started hearing a lot more about pressure independent control valves. Um, this chart here kind of shows like the evolution of, a, of, a, of an hydronic system, right? So on the far left, uh, it used to be constant flow. You'd have your standard control valves, which again, we're referring to as pressure dependent valves um, in conjunction with some manual balancing valves. But, uh, you know, it, energy wasn't uh, uh, at a premium back then, right? So you started to evolve uh, and get into constant speed but variable flow, where you're introducing now uh, manual but also auto-balancing valves in the system. And then as we get more sophisticated and energy efficiency becomes more of a, an issue, uh, you start to get into variable speed and variable flow. Um, while folks are still using pressure-dependent valves along with auto-balancing valves or circuit setters, as you might might call them, they're still not gaining the full advantage of um, a variable flow system. And that's why um, all the way to the right, you see pressure independent control valves starting to, uh, to really uh, sh show up in, in the market. Um, and again, from a Johnson Controls perspective, um, our VG1000 ball valve line and our VG2 and VG7000 globe valve lines are your typical pressure dependent valves. And then those are used in conjunction with, with balancing valves. So you always have two components in this setup. On the pressure independent valve, control valve, there's one uh, product that addresses that, and that's for us, it's the VT140 series. And again, remember on the, on the pressure dependent side, it's position control. On the pressure independent side, it's flow control. So that allows you to really take uh, even further advantage of the varying the speed, slowing it up, um, slowing it down, and all those advantages that you get with um, variable speed systems. Um, you can now fully realize those savings um, when you use a pressure independent control valve. And by the way, the um, hey. yes. Hey Frank, it's Dave. I was just going to add on to that that I think in the back in the day in your graph here, if uh, people on the phone don't have the uh, haven't been around as long as you and I have, um, that was often a, a scenario where if occupancy comfort was the goal, 
you achieve that by uh, wasting energy. We're moving into a world now with pressure independent where we do not have that luxury. We have to have our occupants comfortable, but we've got to do it managing our energy consumption as well. Right, that's a great point. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to point out is um, in terms of um, valve segment growth, what we're seeing, we're seeing standard valves, um, both ball and globe, grow at about 2 to 3% year over year. We're seeing balancing valves actually, uh, actually experience a contraction in the marketplace. And we're seeing pressure independent valves globally grow at about 12% year over year. So it's a, it's definitely a valve segment that uh, is, is, is gaining some, some, some real traction. Okay, jump into a little bit about uh, how they work. So a pressure independent valve combines the function of, of three separate components, really. There's a pressure regulator, which uh, constantly adjusts for any system pressure fluctuations, whether they are induced because of upstream or downstream events. Um, it is a regulating valve, meaning that um, it allows you to set the maximum flow that is allowed through that valve. And then last, uh, it's a control valve, uh, meaning that it will modulate between no flow and whatever the maximum flow that was set on that valve allows it to go to. Um, it, as I mentioned, uh, there's no balancing valves in this in this scenario. So you eliminate not only the valve, but you eliminate the need to go through um, the expensive and time-consuming process of balancing the hydronic system. You just need a few spot checks to make sure that you have a minimum delta P across that valve. I'll talk about that in a, a little bit down the road. But um, it assures that you do not overflow the coil. So again, you're not um, contributing to low delta T syndrome or um, affecting occupant comfort unnecessarily. And then, um, of course, inherent in the name is, you know, it, it, it's independent of those pressure fluctuations. It allows you to uh, design the system uh, more efficiently. It's easier to design the system. So there's no uh, CV calculations required on these valves. They simply get selected based on the design requirements of the coil that you're flowing the water through, and you would select it uh, based on that GPM rating. So, uh, uh, you know, the, these valves, um, they reduce installation cost, also risk, because remember now you just have two joints, right, as opposed to four with the standard uh, control valve and auto balancing valve. Um, it reduces your commissioning cost. Uh, think of the, uh, the um, not, having to auto, not having to balance the hydronic system. And then last, last the, the operational cost will be lower because these contribute to energy savings overall in the building. Again, because you're more efficient in not overflowing or underflowing um, coils, and you're not contributing low delta T, you can experience up to about 25 to 30 percent energy savings uh, by switching over to uh, pressure independent control valve. Now, in a little bit more detail, this is a cross section of our ball valve version of it, and we offer both a, a, a globe valve or up and down stroking valve and a ball valve version. <clears throat> so the heart of every pick valve is the pressure regulator. And its function, again, is to make sure that it keeps a constant differential pressure between P2, which you'll notice is right in front of the ball, um, or in, in a globe valve, it would be right in front of the seat, and the outlet pressure. And it does that by monitoring the the inlet pressure of the valve, P1 and P3. More specifically, um, how this works is uh, the inlet pressure of the valve is transmitted to the top of this diaphragm here. The outlet pressure is transmitted to the bottom of this diaphragm. So right now, I want you to take note of, of what I just said and, and how this works. You'll notice that the diaphragm, it's not responding to the pressure right in front of the ball, 
it's responding to the pressure upstream and the pressure right behind the ball. And that'll become important to remember when we talk about auto balancing valves and how they're different, okay? So back to this diagram here. So these pressures, they act against that spring uh, that you see there in the section. And what they'll do is they'll move this little piece, uh, this little shuttle up and down. So for example, if the inlet pressure or P1 increases, this diaphragm up here is pushed down and it closes that shuttle or moves it closer to uh, that little plug called B there. And what that does, it effectively lowers the uh, delta P from P2 to P3. If you have a change where P1 increases, or I'm sorry, decreases, now um, that shuttle is gonna move up or away from B and increase the effect of delta P, P2 to P3. So all of that goes to say that the delta P that this ball is seeing, so P2 minus P3 is, is being held constant and therefore your flow through that ball is constant at a given ball position. All right, and then, then if you plot that onto a, a valve curve, a flow, a rotation angle versus flow, what that looks like is regardless of the pressure um, fluctuations going across that valve, you'll see, and our ball valves have an equal percentage curve, you'll see that you can predict just based purely on the rotation angle of that valve, what flow you're going to be sending through that valve, irregardless of any pressure fluctuations that are occurring. So why not just use an auto balancing valve? Um, if you look at the top left here, that's kind of a typical diagram. So you have your um, automatic temperature control valve or your um, uh, your pressure dependent control valve, right? So this is responding, let's assume it's it's a proportional control. So it's, it's reacting to a zero to 10 volt signal. Um, downstream from that, you have your auto balance valve. Um, and I will say that the, the term auto balance is kind of a misnomer. It's really uh, a flow limiter and you'll see why in a, in a second here. A um, Couple other systems, you typically have a strainer in front of your um, coil but your flow is going um, you know, through the strainer and the coil, uh, through the control valve, and then into the auto balancing valve. And recall the, the flow equation for pressure dependent valve, Q or your GPM is equal to the CV times the square root of the delta P divided to, by the specific gravity of, of the medium. So for water, it's one, right? That simplifies it. Um, now let's take a look at, at what happens um, when you have that auto balance valve or that flow limiter um, downstream of the control valve. So in a, in a full load condition or a wide open condition, which is where the system balancing took place, um, it works as intended, um, regardless of any pressure fluctuations that it is experiencing, it will limit the amount of flow going through that valve. So it will limit it to your design GPM, right? As, as you would expect. So that's why they call it an auto balancing valve because you'll see on this chart, whether you have a five PSI delta P across this or a, or a um, 60 PSI delta P across this, it is limiting it to its maximum setting. So it, it controls the, the phenomenon of overflowing at a full load condition. Now, the difference is if you're modulating, you're not at a full load condition, you're in a partial load condition. So this is where it gets uh, a little bit tricky when you combine um, proportional control valves or um, even lin or linear control valves, floating uh, control with an auto balancing valve, okay? Um, as you start to close that control valve, if you see where it is in the system, you're affecting the inlet pressure of the auto balancing valve. So what happens? Well, the auto balancing valve is going to try to auto balance. So it will open up, right? It will adjust to make sure 
um, that it's allowing the maximum GPM through. That's its purpose in life, right, is to supply the maximum GPM and no more. It doesn't care about less, right? So uh, what you're essentially doing is though, even though you throttle down your control valve, your balancing valve adjusted with that spring to make sure that the, the delta P across the control valve and what it sees is now increased again so that you have more flow going through. So at partial load conditions, um, you're still overflowing a valve. And what do I mean by that? Again, here on the left, so um, those same components kind of uh, mapped out here. Um, this is the auto balancing valve. Again, it, it's downstream of the control valve. At full open position, everything is fine, right? This is what it was balanced at. You're not overflowing the coil. You're getting the flow that you need through it. Um, however, when you start to throttle, what happens? Well, as I talked about, the auto balancing valve, its mission is to react to the delta P that it sees, and it is downstream of the control valve. So it's going to respond to that throttling back, and it's going to open itself up. So even though your control system throttles back, and based on the valve position, you would expect to be further down on that flow curve, what you'll see and notice is that you're still way at the top, so the maximum flow going through that valve. So not only are you um, uh, not responding um, to the control system like you thought you like the control system thought it would, and you're affecting occupant comfort, and there's a delay and a lag in the response to it, the system. You're also, if you notice, the return uh, water temperature is colder than it should be, right? Because you're sending way too much water through there. So you're starting to contribute to low delta T syndrome. Now, in, in contrast, on a pick valve, you've eliminated the auto balancing valve because that's integrated into the valve. And again, it's, it's balancing, it's looking at the inlet pressure of the valve and the pressure right behind the ball of that valve, okay? So it's able to instantaneously adjust for that. So as I start to throttle down my pressure independent control valve, I move down on that flow curve. Remember I showed you that flow curve with the little dots, you can follow it all the way up based on a given position, you know where you are at flow. And that's how this manifests itself on this valve here. Okay. So let's talk about uh, RVP 140 series. So we have a number of options available. We have, as I mentioned, we have a globe valve or a linear valve, which is up and down stroke. Um, we have a brand new model that we're excited to talk to you about today, and it's got some unique features and, and patented capability that we'll talk about. Um, that's available in a half inch and three quarter inch, um, and those flows, and we'll get into a little bit more on that. On the ball valve size, um, which have a slightly higher close-off pressure. So our, our linear valves have a 100 PSI close-off pressure, uh, which is still uh, substantially higher than, than most linear um, pick valves in the market. And on our globe valve, or, I'm sorry, on our ball valve versions, which are available in that brass body style from half inch to inch and a quarter, and in that cast iron body style from inch and a quarter to two inches, those have a close-off pressure of um, 100 PSI. They're available in on-off, uh, uh, floating, proportional, non-spring return and spring return actuator options. Um, and all of our valves, by the way, have the, um, the pressure ports uh, included in them, which allow you to test uh, and make sure that uh, you have a minimum delta P across that valve. So you don't have to install extra pressure taps uh, um, in front or of or behind the valve. Just a quick overview of the uh, kind of the landscape of load pick valves, kind of the leaders in the market, and, and how we compare. Um, Danfoss uh, globally is probably the, the leader, I will say. They supply the Schneider uh, valve uh, as well. Flocon is a valve that's out there, and then and then Freze is a brand, a European brand that supplies. Uh, the valves for Bray, commercial, and for Siemens. Um, most of them, uh, we have some, some comparisons there. Uh, what you'll see is we have higher close-off pressure, uh, 
Uh, we offer the ability to have equal percentage or linear, depending on how you want to control that system. Um, but the real um, thing that we're excited about um, is, is this new version here, very compact package, um, available in those four uh, GPM ratings. And again, remember, these can be um, throttled down or the maximum setting can be changed. I'll talk about that. Um, we are going to be extending these um, to add even more uh, ranges on this. Uh, the close-off pressure on these is 100 PSI, and they come with this uh, uh, white little actuator, which is our VA7480, which is actually shown with our pick valve, but it's actually a, a universal terminal unit um, linear actuator that uh, we'll talk about as well. So what, what's so great about this little compact version we just introduced? Well, we have a, a patented cartridge design on this valve. Um, so if you're in a situation where you have less than ideal water quality, right? Maybe uh, you have some folks that fall behind on their maintenance of their water system. You have some debris or contamination following, what have you. Um, what we're able to offer here is a cartridge that um, we've exposed to a very extreme um, contaminated water test. It's our strike testing that we do on our ball valves and so forth. That's 900 ppm of iron oxide contaminated water, which is essentially sludge, if you can almost call it that. So we cycle this valve through 100,000 cycles. And we've done this with um, all of the major competitors side by side as well. And one of the things I, I wanted to, to show is, well, how does that, what does that really mean? Dirty free patented cartridge, what, what do you get from that? Of course, you're not gonna have 900 ppm in your system. But it does give some, some indication of its robustness. So uh, the chart on the left is, uh, is RVP140, one of our models. The chart on the right um, is, uh, is, is typical of a competitive sample that we, we have, uh, a number of these. So what you'll see is at the outset, we're both doing you know, fairly consistent flow over a wide delta P range prior to the test. And again, that's what you want. That's what you expect with a pressure independent control valve. Uh, if you reach your minimum delta P, once you're above that, you start to enter the, the um, pressure independent range. So you'll see there, even though your delta P increases, your flow remains constant. And again, this, this chart, uh, we're not changing the valve position, we're simply varying the delta P across the valve. Now what happens after, what do these valves look like after the test? Um, the darker curves represent uh, after 100,000 full cycles in that contaminated water test. And you'll see our, our VP140 is still pretty, lines up pretty well um, over the um, as new um, testing. On the right hand side, um, what's happened is we're now unable to maintain the, first of all, the accuracy, right? So we're expected at this valve position to flow slightly over four GPM. Now we're somewhere in between three or, or two, depending on whether you're coming down or whether you're increasing the delta P or, or, or decreasing the delta P. So how that manifests is now you're unable to supply the flow that's required by that coil, right? You can't serve it with enough water flow. Right? That's one problem. The other problem you notice is that you are no longer pressure independent, right? As you vary that delta P, um, your flow uh, fluctuates wildly. So in, in this case, if you did want to get back up to your design flow capacity, you would have to increase the delta P across that valve to achieve that. And then lastly, you know that there's an introduction of hysteresis. So depending on whether you're increasing or decreasing your delta P across that valve, your, um, your control is kind of all over. There's a wide range there on where you're going to be in terms of flow. So this is all, all goes to say that over time, what you've lost is your accuracy and your capability to supply sufficient flow you will lose control capability, meaning your actuator is going to be hunting, right? It's going to be trying, it, your control signal is going to try to search uh, and get that coil to respond, and your actuator is going to 
going to wear out to say nothing of the um, occupant comfort and the energy waste that's occurring here. So let me kind of go now to the, uh, the ball valve version. Uh, you're probably familiar with the Bolimo PIQCD product that's out there. That's available in a half inch and three quarter inch. So the, uh, the only mechanical versions that Bolimo offers are in those two sizes. Um, Honeywell um, has the Griswold uh, ball valve. They're available in half inch to three inches. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, those two models there. We cover half inch all the way up to two inches uh, as well from a mechanical standpoint. Um, and of course, all non-spring non return and spring return actuator options available with those, with those valves. Um, real quick view. So this is our, our ball valve line, right? Our valves are, you can purchase them with uh, just the valve standalone or valve and actuator mounted uh, together. And I'll, I'll flip through these slides here. This is just an overview just to show the various uh, combinations we have. Um, and then this is the cast iron version, right? Also non-spring return, spring return. The, um, the unique feature about the actuator for this large one on the non-spring return is one actuator addresses on-off loading or proportional in one actuator. You can simply select that um, on that actuator. So let me jump to how do you adjust the flow. On this little compact one, very easy, right? You uh, unscrew the, the actuator um, or this uh, shipping cap um, if you receive it that way. And let's say you wanted a valve that a half inch valve um, and the design flow is one GPM. You would select the uh, HDA model, which is a 1.9 GPM model. You look on that chart, you see how 0.96 is about a five. You, ro you rotate your dial to five and now your maximum flow that that valve allows through is just the one GPM, right? So that's how you would adjust that. Couple of quick notes about the actuator that ships with this. Uh, compact version. It ships configured in um, with a zero to ten signal, um, reverse acting. So these valves are push to close, right? That's why it's a reverse acting setup. It ships uh, in the linear mode, and uh, as I mentioned, volts DC. And the um, uh, now the, the interesting with this actuator is you can change that, right? You can pop this top off and flip these dip switches. So you can select whether you want a zero to 10 signal or zero to 20 milliamp, zero to five, zero to 10 volts, or two to 10 volts or four to 20 milliamp signal. You can say that, well, I, I really want reverse acting. So when I have 10 volts on it, I want the valve to be closed. So you would flip that switch. You can also tell it to be an equal percentage valve. So that will give you that equal percentage curve that we talked about way at the beginning of this valve. That's a neat little thing with this actuator. And again, this, this actuator is, is a standard terminal unit actuator that, that works with any terminal unit valve out there that has an M30 connection and a less than a six millimeter stroke. Um, setting the, the maximum flow on the ball valves is a little more, it's more of a, uh, these valve, ball valves are typically in a more engineered um, approach where you have a BAS system and you want to, for example, uh, do some seasonal uh, modifications or you have uh, varying room layouts, you can change these remotely. Um, and how you would do that is you would characterize the control signal. So again, if you would look on the chart to where you would want to limit the, the GPM on that valve, uh, in this particular example, it would correspond to an 80% setting. So if you're operating on a zero to 10 volt signal, you would you would cap that at eight volts and that would limit the rotation to um, you know, 80% of that, of that turn, giving you that half a GPM there. On the uh, cast iron versions, um, you can manually change those um, using a, a presetting device on there, um, or you can also leave it alone and do it via the control signal. But if you do it with a manual um, setting device, you would simply, again, look at the chart, um, unscrew a couple set screws, rotate it through the pr proper percentage presetting, tighten it up, and now you've, you've mechanically limited the stroke, and then the actuator will auto-calibrate and find those, those endpoints there. So um, 
I want to make sure we have some time for questions here, but a couple couple last minute things here. All of our um, brass body valves are field serviceable. So the new compact one, let's say you have an issue when you're doing a flushing, either there wasn't a bypass installed or closed off correctly, or you had something go through, whatever happened, whatever the case may be, or 10 years down the road, you're, you have a, a, an issue. What you can do is you can swap out uh, or open up this valve and pull out that cartridge, and you can either clean it if it's just, a, as I mentioned, an issue with a startup and flushing or something, or you can replace that cartridge. Uh, no special tools needed other than a, a, a 21 millimeter wrench. Um, just simply unscrew the actuator, uh, unscrew this uh, cartridge, and again, you can clean it or replace it. Um, and then you can also do that on our brass body ball valve versions. Um, same thing, you can access that, um, that pressure regulator. Some other uh, competitors do not um, allow you to access that, meaning that if you do have an issue, you have to unthread and remove the whole valve, which may or may not be an issue depending if you had the foresight and you added cost to, to add unions uh, on, on either side of the valve or, or what have you. So that's another feature of, of these valves. And then one, one last thing to consider from a, from a um, I, I guess, value add perspective, all of our valve tagging is uh, included when you order the valve. There's no additional charge for each tag. Um, they, they ship standard with the model specific information, so the valve code number, the maximum flow, what the actuator is, all of that stuff. You can add a custom information, so if you want the valve factory preset to a certain GPM, that will be done at the factory and the tag will reflect that. And you can also add um, location specific information um, that would allow you to um, you know, add fan coil, uh, 101, for example, on there, so you know where on the job that will go. And by the way, that that a little label is, is is put on the outside of the box as well. So even without opening it, you know where to where that valve will go. But uh, that uh, kind of concludes the presentation, and I I think. All right. Well, there you go. Hopefully, you enjoyed that. Like I say, Johnson is not the first person to come out with the pressure independent control valve. I think Belima was the first one we began handling back in the day. Belima makes great products. Siemens has a great pick valve. Honeywell has a great pick valve. But as you saw from the video, Johnson, depending on the application, might have the right fit for you. So, if you need to get a, uh, more information on a Johnson pick valve, you can go to your local Johnson Controls distributor. If you don't know who that is, hey, you got www.stromquist.com. We are a master distributor based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we cover Florida. And we can hook you up or we can hook you up with your local distributor, whatever works best for you. I right, appreciate you tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Appreciate it. And we will see you, HVAC Control Pro, next time.